Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the, uh, what is, I believe, the final session of today, which is, as you can see, a panel discussion of all the, the key speakers we have, we've had today. And um, my name is Anders Kutt and I'm going to be the moderator. There will be a chance to um, ask, ask questions from the panel, but uh, let me get started with, uh, with this one. So, I think it has been emphasized repeatedly today that security is not something that you can bolt on into a, onto a system as sort of an additional feature, right? The, a, 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 a approach to security needs to be holistic in some way. At the same time, if we consider everything too holistically, we end up building information security for the entire universe, which is slightly too large. So how do you think we can sort of find that balance, sort of where is that boundary of that holistic security and how do we make sure that everybody has the same notion of where that boundary is? Anybody? It's, it's, it's an interesting question and, and, and it's, it's about risk appetite. So, so what are you willing to lose? Um, obviously, if I'm putting up a, a website for three days to get some email addresses in and, and uh, give away a fabulous price and at the end and then scratch that website, I'm not going to spend three years of developing a security model around that because I don't have that much to lose. Um, on the other hand, if I'm building a nationwide identity system um, where people might have concerns about privacy, where people will rely on for financial transactions, there's a, a much greater emphasis on, uh, on security. So, so it, it really, as much within security, the answer is it depends. Uh, and, and, and there's no single answer to, to how secure should something be. Um, ideally, as secure as possible or as secure as needed and, and not much securer, secure because security always comes at a cost. Yeah, true. So, but what about when, when people get involved, when, when people become part of the system? How do you secure a system that has people in it? And people are weak, as, as we know. Well, uh, to, to my mind, uh, really, it works like this. Uh, as, as I said also before, 90% uh, of the events technology works. Yeah. And, um, and maybe even more. We can always re rely on technology. Uh, but it doesn't end there. Uh, people get involved on a second layer when decisions need to be made. And this is where things get stuck, really, really stuck, especially when certain decisions go uh, really high up. And the top la layer, uh, to me, on the, on the security side is, uh, is really when an individual uh, gets involved, because this is, the, this is absolutely uh, the weakest link. This is where things get broken. Uh, when we talk about uh, you know, uh, the ho holistic view, I think uh, what, where we should start from is to accept uh, that view, that there are other elements than boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what we always see. Uh, for instance, when we deliver a system, this is what we discussed before as well in the, during the coffee break, everybody is interested in boxes. And they think that if they have boxes in place, it's absolutely fine. And we see not so much investment in training, not so much investment in maintenance. They say we have a lot of money to invest in boxes, and then when the boxes are delivered, then they say, but we don't have money for people. Uh, boxes are not going to solve the problem. Uh, so this is, uh, this is number one. And I think, um, you know, to insert that uh, holistic view, uh, or at least uh, a some level of security, when we, th when we think about, um, when we think about, and this is something that we have been discussing with Jan a lot, when we think about launching all kinds of new e-services, really large-scale e-services, I think we need to, to start uh, thinking about uh, building a certain percentage of security, impartial security assessment 
into those into those systems. It's cool to have all kinds of services, but at least we need to we need to discuss what is the level of, of, of security system that needs to be built in already in the budget. Is it four percent? Is it eight percent? Can it go as high as ten percent? So so this is uh, uh, point number two that I would like to make. And very quickly, point number three is the risk assumption. Uh, it goes exponentially. I mean, uh, we need to discuss about that as well. Uh, uh, to assume 75% risk, it would, the solution would cost you 5,000. To assume 80% of the risks, the solution would cost you 50,000. 85% uh, of the risk would cost you 500,000. And 98%, we are going 50 million. So um, there should be some level of risk acceptance, I think. All right. So fair enough. The Estonian government will in institute that that X percent, whatever that is, is going to be the acceptable risk level of all, all e-services. Therefore, spending on information security will go up and it's all going to end up on Anton's lap, right? <laughs> You're going to build a secure software, or? I don't know, maybe. We, we didn't do many of our government projects because of the different, different reasons uh, and inflexibility usually of the government. Uh, our customers, but uh, on the other hand, if, uh, on the other hand, if, if we talk about the uh, of the development perspective and the uh, weak uh, part of the security, the human beings is that uh, I personally would like to build uh, many protections into into the system that will avoid uh, mistakes or common mistakes that are made by the humans, like the end users and even the developers. What, what, what I was uh, talking about in my session today is that actually <clears throat> you need to actually build your framework that you use to develop your system so that it will help you avoid uh, the common mistakes that uh, developers will inevitably make. So you're, you're sitting there and saying that developers actually make mistakes. Hmm. Gee. <laughs> new, new concept. Um, but how, do you, how does a developer know that they have made a mistake? Right? There's this uh, notion of expect, expected level of security. Right? A knife is inherently dangerous because you can cut people with it. But you can also cut onions. So, you know, there's a trade-off and everybody has a knife in their house. If, so if developers is usually not uh, having a knife or something, it's usually uh, uh, not preventing access to some uh, stuff that, uh, that is not meant to be accessed by the user. So th this is the usual type of the mistakes that developers make. So they don't protect their system well enough. And uh, how do they know about that? Of course, uh, in, in some cases they don't. Like the uh, hard bleed was undetected for two years. Uh, but uh, considering that it was an open source software, it's very uh, very bad thing that happened. But uh, what we still do and uh, what actually was missed in case of hard bleed is the code review. So somebody else need to always review the code. We in, at Codeborn, we do that uh, by pair programming. So we always write all the code actually by two developers. So there's a, a smaller probability that one person will miss something. And then uh, if there is uh, more secure or more critical parts of the code that it need to be reviewed once again, and of course everything needs to be tested. Because, uh, I mean, uh, automated tests. So what we do is that we uh, write a lot of unit tests, and especially for security uh, critical parts of code that are actually check the access and uh, do as authorizations in the code, this should be double checked, triple checked, and. Uh, and triple tested, all kind of cases, even the, what you basically need to do is that in your uh, unit tests even, you need to write tests that test for negative scenarios that actually try to send some uh, wrong data uh, purpose, purposely and, uh, and verify that the system reacts accordingly. Okay. I'm, I'm glad that you brought the heart bleed up, heart bleed up. Uh, if anybody doesn't know what heart, heart bleed is, please go check out the XKCD com uh, comic on this uh, excellent description. Um, if anybody doesn't know what XKCD is, then contact me later. 
Um, <laughs> but you brought up a very interesting question of, um, that has been said that um, open SSL is, which is monocultures, which means that there's something that everybody, everything depends on, and that one thing, if that turns out to be insecure, everybody's in trouble. So can we get a comment on that from the Microsoft representative in the, in the panel? I'm not that good in, in commenting uh, the development part. Uh, I, can, I can really comment the operational part of, of, uh, uh, of uh, the security. And, and, uh, and uh, what I quite often see also is, uh, is when, when talking to my customers and they go really like to the last bit level of uh, what is your cloud system all about and, and so on and so on. And, uh, and this IT security guy has an Android phone on the table. And I see that he answers it without any, any code. And I said, OK, but do you have any, any antivirus on it? Ah, oh, but I haven't had the time really to install it yet here also. So, so we can really go to this 50 million level on, on those things and then have this unprotected Android phone full of whatever things where all the emails and sensitive information flows in our back pocket at this very moment. And, and uh, so what is our security level now? To this 50 million level of 98% or to this 5,000 level? So, so what we are, what I quite often see also is this big picture that, okay, yes, we are talking about those things and those bits in that code. And, and, and at the same time, it's really easy to take it from some other place. You have really strong door but some Giproc wall next to it. And, and, uh, so yeah. what's the overall security level now? Yeah. Okay, I would like to add, uh, regarding uh, developers, uh, as a customer, I have recognized often that there exist two issues. Developer uh, needs to produce the product as cheap as possible. And then it depends on another issue. How smart is the customer? Yep. Is uh, the customer able to describe the requirements of this system? Or not. If uh, he described very well and high level, then probably lack of resources, extremely visible it's in public sector. And how to solve uh, this conflict of interest? Any I good ideas? I think one of the solutions actually to always do the pen testing of any system that is delivered by any developers, even the good guys as we are, uh, we still make mistakes. So, <laughs> and pen testing is the only way of actually showing that. It, it, it is, but it's, it's also about, about other aspects. I mean, if, I'm, I'm quite surprised that you suggested to, to pick a fixed budget for security because it leads to the self-destructing mindset that you talked about. Because if we say you have to spend 50% of your budget on security, what will people do? They'll do the easiest thing to spend the 50% of the budget and they'll buy more boxes or they'll buy more pen testing services. Exactly. Where, where you, as, as Heartbleed to really showed that it was, they did peer review. These are not guys that are known for their weak security. I mean, you can probably not find very much guys that know more about computer security than the guys coding on, on, on OpenSSL. But they are underfunded. We, as a, as a community, allow the OpenSSL uh, consortium to operate on something like, uh, I believe they get in like $4,000 of donations per year. And they put their heart and soul on something that's become so critical to society that it's, it's maybe even, even, even a bit scandalous that we've let that happen. And, and now we're reaping yeah, the, the problems from that. Partly I said that because I'm in marketing. So <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, this, is, this is my job. But uh, but my, my, my point really was that, uh, you know, as an example, to use the percentage, we need to introduce some ways to, to quantify the risk or, 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 or yeah. somehow to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to get the thinking in place that, that we, really, really need to, we, we really need to do something. I, I don't know if, if it's a good model. It's a, it's a provocative, uh, perhaps it's a provocative thought, but, uh, but somehow we need to, uh, I think we, we, when we are talking especially about e-service, we need to get the discussion going, how can we, 
how can we uh, pay more, more attention to the, to the security. And I, I, I completely agree. On top of the fixed budget or not fixed budget, or at least some framework, we need to talk about opening the systems more to the third party review. This is, uh, this is something I think uh, this, that is coming more and more. Uh, into, um, into the picture and, uh, and also to pay more and more attention to the human behavior. This is, uh, again, we have, we have better tools available now that are not so expensive. I, I, I think a uh, couple of years ago, even, it used to be, it used to be uh, almost the privilege of banks that were only able to afford uh, in order to protect their banking secrecy something that traces the human behavior. Uh, I think uh, now, luckily, the algorithms uh, are, are, are trained uh, already so well that, uh, that, that they go cheaper and, uh, and there is competition and, uh, and also emphasis uh, to, be, to be paid. We, um, we work closely with an Israeli company who is selling uh, cyber human intelligence software. And, uh, and they say that in the social engineering, when, when you plan an attack and start the social engineering uh, part of it, the usual mistake that people make in, in attacking Israel, for instance, uh, by pretending to be from Israel, is that they do something on Saturday, because nobody <laughs> does anything on Saturday. So we have a built-in system. If you are uh, an Israeli, then software doesn't allow you to do anything on Saturday or you cannot post a picture of a pork chop uh, on your Facebook page. So, um, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the small human factors are, I think, significant. They can, they can spoil. Uh, we, we need to help people to make the right, the humans to make the right decision. And, and, and you alluded to that in your design uh, as well. Yeah, I think the, the people can be our weakest link, link in security, but it can be all the strongest uh, enabler. Because if we look at the, the, the traffic accidents and the drop in the past 10 years of traffic accident statistics, it's not about that cars got 10 times safer or 5 times safer, whatever. It was like people started to understand that it is an issue and just drive a little bit slower. I mean, just key a bit more and already that is, is, is good result in statistics. So if we are able to actually tell that and then and, and show that security is important because it is still a new area for most of the people. There has been the topic there for, for you know, 10 years for the most of the people, right? Not 20 years. And for this decision makers, probably five years. So it's still, we have to push that. And, not, and from side, one side in society and also inside IT to get out those barriers what we have. Hmm? Yeah, good. And do you agree that there is some similarities uh, regarding learning the language? If you try to learn the language uh, very fast, very uh, intensive method, uh, then the result will not be very good. But if you organize a kind of security awareness courses, science, lightly, lightly, during a couple of years, then the outcome might be better and will last longer. It's, it's about exposure. We really start to learn a language when you're forced to use it on a daily, on a daily basis. I, I, I've lived in London for, for a while. Before that, I thought I spoke English, but I couldn't understand the, 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 the lady who spoke in the subway. Um, when I lived there for, for half a year, all of a sudden, I could understand the lady in the, in the subway. So in order for, for developers to become good at security, they have to be exposed to a hostile environment. They have to, to, when they submit their code, it has to be tortured almost. And, and get the immediate feedback that this code you wrote, it's weak because this will happen. And, and only once you've had that experience long enough, you start to think in that way. Uh, the other thing is that the language uh, we speak now, we all understand specifications wrong. A specification is not, we, we write specifications in, the system must do this, and then we test that the system does do that, and then we think we're done. But we have to change that for the system must only do this. And that's the whole, that's, that's also a language thing. We, we need to better understand specs. Anton, you had a comment on that. Yeah, actually, I was thinking that I'm pretty sure that we need to teach security in uh, primary school now, or in high school, whatever. Uh, in uh, whatever school that actually is obligatory for everyone because uh, nowadays we use a lot of technology and the next generation they are 
probably in the first grade they sit with their mobile phones and Facebook and everything, they need to understand actually what is behind that and w what are the uh, outcomes if they do something wrongly or tell somebody their password. So it's, uh, I don't know, how can we have somebody from Ministry of Education here <laughs> to comment? Yeah, well, that's actually ties neatly back to the earlier question about how do we do the risk assessment. I mean, if we, we have bank and, and that deals with money, well, in that case, it is relatively easy to tack a, a price tag to, to a certain risk. But when we're talking about uh, the souls of our, ch our children or, let's say, democracy, then how do we assess the, the risk of that? Jan, what do you... No, definitely you can actually assess, you can actually measure the different performance of the different, uh, different societies if you want. But this is clear actually that, uh, that Anton's point actually that we, uh, we have to teach the children is correct. Mm -hmm. We should teach the children about in the same age where we, we have to talk about the sex actually, that, uh, <laughs> about the third grade. Uh, uh, because now what is the alternative? They will uh, learn it in the street and yeah. then you don't, co don't control it actually. And uh, no, what is valuable for chil children is the reputation on their peers and no, bullying is actually no, happening there and, and all those kind of things are happening already in the, in the society of the school ch children. But they wanted actually to come back actually about the securities uh, <coughs> that uh, what we actually do is where that we are implementing uh, some model of the process. Uh, the, the problem with the infrastructure is that we really don't know what processes will, 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 will run on top of it. But uh, now when we, we know this process, <coughs> then, uh, then uh, with the security, what we're doing actually, we are providing the tools to, to either avoid or handle actually the process deviations. Now this is the, 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 the thing. About this coding errors also, now there are some, some formal methods that assuming that your model is correct, you can even uh, no, uh, prove the code that is 10 times more expensive actually than to write the code and you can generate the code. And uh, uh, no, one thing that we definitely have to do is actually to, uh, to provide the feedback to the guy who uh, is responsible for this, uh, this uh, process, uh, where it works. Uh, for example, in the civil aviations, the, the, the uh, the uh, accidents are quite rare. If we actually compare how much we fly, I think that the level of the, of the accidents there is in the 10 minus 10, uh, 10 minus uh, 9 actually uh, catastrophe per, uh, per, uh, per uh, flight hours, Some, somewhere in this, kind of this order. And how those guys actually achieve it is by feedback of the process, that each time actually something happens actually, they learn it back, and, uh, and uh, no, yeah, they, this, this way they are, they are making the, the, the process better. But, but it also leads to, to over-engineering, because if you look at a jet engine, mm. it takes about 20 parts to make a fully functional, efficient jet engine. And then the other 9,980 parts around it are there because somewhere something went wrong and somebody's is collecting it. So it comes at, it comes at a huge cost. Yeah, it's not, airplanes are, are very, very expensive things. Yeah, and drones are not actually because people are flying on the, those things and, and uh, those uh, uh, security requirements are much lower, yes, of course. Yeah. 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 I actually, I also, I, I don't really believe in process uh, that fix anything because there are always humans and bureaucracy that actually uh, like kills everything. What <clears throat> I, I have an idea actually. If if there is a budget for security, then the best way to spend it is uh, start with pen tests, and the next step is what Google does. You just use it as a fund to for prizes for the people who actually break into your system. So Google, I think, uses that pretty successfully. I've heard that people get like ten thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars for like finding some uh, vulnerabilities. And in that case, it's probably for m most vulnerabilities, it's uh, like more, uh, uh, it's better for the for the attacker actually to get this money from the Google than to try to exploit that. So if this prize money is uh, good enough, then maybe it makes sense to just 
tell Google about it. Yeah, but when you think actually what you do, then you are, you are uh, basically, as with the money, you are speeding up the feedback. Yes. This yes. is what you are yeah. essentially The feed, feedback is essential, and yes, that's correct. Yeah. You had a comment? Oh, yeah. And, and, and to comment on top of that, but this is only just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, this is the technology piece. And again, I don't want to talk too much about old war stories, but, but for instance, uh, just one example. We, um, when American president visits any country, uh, there is a secret service requirement that uh, any civilian aircraft that is hijacked, this is after September 11th, that is in the airspace of that country must be shut down. When George W. Bush visited Tallinn, we had scrambled two F-16 jets that were flying on, in the Tallinn uh, and in, on, on, in, in Estonia. The, um, we tested it. We tested the procedure and uh, when you look at the Estonian map you think it's small, but for the air operations it's actually surprisingly big. You can do that. Now the question became, who takes the decision? Because it's a lose lose decision. Nobody wants to take that decision. If you don't shoot the plane down, it will crash into, uh, I don't know, you know, in, in some very big building, uh, killing a lot of people. If you take that decision, you are a killer yourself. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a political nightmare scenario. Uh, at that time, uh, it was Mr. Jurgen Ligi who volunteered, and uh, so the law became that it was, it was Minister of Defense at that time. So uh, it, it, it became Minister of Defense's decision, but we don't have any fighters. They had to be US fighters. So somehow we needed to come up with a procedure that Estonian Minister of Defense orders US fighters who would be liability free. US fighters are not here on a bilateral basis. They would be NATO fighters. So the US fighters were lent to a German, uh, German staff uh, in, in Brunsum, or I, I don't even remember where. So it had to be, we had to put the German colonel between that. Colonel is a too low level. So we had to find another job. So it, it goes on and on and on. So physically you can do it. Technology allows you to do it. But if you actually start going through that process to shut that plane down, it gets stuck in the decision making. But that most of the IT security incidents, I mean, read the data breach report, none of that 87 or 78 percent of those breaches that were, were really didn't take any skill. So, so on the one hand, we're, we're dealing with, with the top, and on the other hand, mm -hmm. we're dealing with the very low, low profile things. And if, if you look, for instance, at, at, at cyber criminals, you can see that they're right now mostly concentrating on, on the low hanging fruit. I mean, these guys have regular work days. You see less attacks in the weekends than you see during work days. Um, if you patch your security holes, they don't go and find a new hole to exploit in your infrastructure. They just move to somebody else who has, to, who has the same hole. So, so on the one hand, we need to work, work from the bottom up and make sure that everybody has a sort of base level of security. Just as we all feel it's normal to lock your door, to have a lock on the doors in your house. But I saw an interview with a 100-year-old lady who was really annoyed when she had to start locking her door and having, having locks and kept forgetting her keys and, and, and it really came at a cost to her. Now we think that cost is acceptable. So for software, we need to start indeed making sure that we get things like cross-site scripting out there. Everybody puts uh, cross-site request forgery protection on there. Basic things and then on the other hand, the absolute security when you're talking about national level, when you're talking about people's life, when you're talking about nuclear reactors, is, is, is a completely different, different game. And there's people with, with completely different stakes there who, who are acting there. I think, yes, we, we need to, to look on, on both ends. And uh, to illustrate that, we can ask that, that what process has uh, saved more lives, surgery or washing hands? So. No. Search is washing hands. <laughs> so, so basically what you're telling me is that um, when I invest into information security, I make somebody else's life miserable because the criminals will go and harass somebody else instead of harassing me. 
Yeah, and in, 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 in a sense, it's, it's herd mentality. <laughs> why, why is there safety in, in, in a big herd of cattle? Is because a predator can only kill one cow at a time. Therefore, the, the average, uh, the average, uh, true. yeah, the average, uh, what do you call it? The average uh, crowd of cows is, is safe. The average cow in there is safe. But the one cow that gets eaten is, is the one that loses out. And it is the one that is usually ill or, or otherwise, otherwise debilitated. And then you have to make sure that you keep fit. Yeah. Yeah, there is one point, actually, that we, we, we know how that should be done is actually uh, keep uh, things uh, scaling uh, or, or stop uh, the attack scaling. Uh, no, it should be the, the, the goal. Where we can actually see similar things is antiviruses. They are actually not helping against any virus, but uh, those things are actually garbage collectors that collect the, 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 the virus when somebody already had the attack and uh, and the pattern was, uh, was written against. So, so pr by principle, actually, this, this antivirus is, is the, the garbage collector. And a uh, similar way, actually, by feeding back the, the not quickly, the information to the, to the people that they can charge, that there was an attack, and uh, uh, no, it will actually help, actually, to top the, the, stop the th thing scaling. So that's why I'm saying also about these investments that uh, that if you don't know actually where to invest, then invest into detection, not into prevention, invest into detection. But, but also invest in, in your basis. I think there's, there's just not enough investment in, in basic security in, in training developers to deal with yeah, security problems. Yeah, but at the same problems. time, people are also using this kind of silly, silly mechanism, like for authentication, they are still using passwords. Although the replay attack works actually, and we are making actually people lives miserable uh, in remembering those uh, those complex passwords, and in the principle, no password cannot work as a mechanism. And still, everybody is using that. And now we are doing the federations, and I don't know what what kind of tricks actually. Why people cannot change it? Yeah, and then you are talking about the basics. Well, why? Oh, because why the is cost of any. I don't know. Well, it, it, is, it is because the cost of, of using anything else but a password is too high. We, we as users are not willing to carry around a token or, 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 or have a device with us all the time that if we don't have it with us, we can't log into Facebook. There's, there's plenty of people who are not willing to carry such a device around or would leave Facebook if they have to, had to use like SMS authentication. Well, then, then you're accepting the consequences also, you're using this mechanism. Or they're it's, not it's seeing the consequences. Are, eh? Or they're not seeing the consequences because they're not being trained. They're not aware that they're in a big herd and there's predators around. Okay. I think part of that is, is, is the case, actually. And if you are seeing those uh, surveys, uh, how many people who are actually doing something in online, then I think in US, actually, 80% of people have, have seen some kind of identity theft. Yeah, but the cost, the cost of identity theft is with the bank. The identity theft, in the end, if they can say, I'm, I've been a victim to identity theft, they get their money back from the bank. And, and yes, it costs them a lot, of, a, a lot of hassle, but they're not going bankrupt. And the bank is not going bankrupt. But here is a calculation also, because the, the, the most cost, actually, in the case of the identity theft, is not actually getting this money back that was, was stolen, but lost productivity. Yes, and it, this is general, actually, in the, in the cyber security also, that, uh, that most of the costs that will be incurred will be actually lost productivity, not actually this, this, those, uh, those direct losses. Yes, but has anybody, any company really gone out of business because of lost productivity? Is it really damaging to us? I, I think it it's really comes down to we're not being trained properly. Yeah, if you, if you talk about the case of the passwords and, and there's just people not willing to, I mean, Gmail, prob Google probably has good statistics on that because they've enabled dual factor, but I still see a lot of people logging into their Gmail with just a username and password. And it's not even complex for Google, but they are not to me. Probably promoting it enough because uh, I think that if we have on the streets like advertisements, like do not speed with your car or something like that, you can also have the public advertisement that do not uh, use a password for your, uh, for, for your important stuff on the internet. And uh, in the US, actually, I've talked to some people. I know that currently 
a lot of more than half of internet banks in, uh, in the US they actually have only login and password for, for authentication. And uh, the reason is that people don't want to have this more complex uh, authentication. Like they don't want to carry another device. They don't want the hassle. And that's why actually people, they are forcing banks to keep this because those banks who abandon this uh, scheme, they uh, lose their customers. Customers just go to another bank which still provides the username and password stuff. I think we could look at car industry like 10 years ago when they started to, to show the, the NCAP, Aeron cap tests of the car safety. And they started to really publish that in, in uh, the safer car costs more. But nowadays all the cars having five stars. 10 years ago some very good brands had the two stars there. So it created kind of pressure from user's side because the safety was, okay, it's my life. The cyber security, maybe it's not too much, but my privacy. It might be a solution kind of there. But the, okay. There's, a, there's yeah. a comment from the audience. Okay, I will comment this bank side then, then actually, what, what Anton actually brought, brought up. Uh, this was funny actually because now we, we really made those, uh, those, uh, those uh, bank limits actually where you were used, uh, you were forced actually to do the, the stronger authentication. And we had one bank, bank actually, the Sampo actually a little bit tricking around it, and uh, and uh, the the business guys were really actually afraid of that uh, that we will lose customers. Mm -hmm. You are always actually afraid of the things that you don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we did. We lost three customers. <laughs> <gasps> so just as a comment to Frank, um, in Estonia we have this ID card, which yeah. is also you can like digitally sign, which is. You know, in, in this sense, it's all good. But the idea behind it is that almost everyone is, um, well, at, at least everyone should, by law, carry it with, on, with them, or at least some form of ID. And because it's like everyone should have an ID card, everyone should also carry one with, with uh, them at all the time. And that, that's basically set by law here in Estonia. But, but can you use your, your ID card, and I, I don't know your system well enough to answer that question, but can you use your ID card with your Gmail to log into your Gmail? No, no. because Gmail doesn't support it. So, so still you need to have a, have a second part. Yes, but at the same time, even though this device is available, people still build systems that use passwords uh, intended to be used in Estonia. But... Uh, because Gmail does support, I think, uh, <coughs> what is it called, open auth yeah. or open authentic authentication, and the Estonian ID card basically supports that. So it is technically possible to use Gmail with your ID card. So are you using it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> uh, I don't use Gmail. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Anton, you had a comment? <laughs> uh, probably not now. <laughs> okay. Anybody else from the owners? Yes. There's a question right there. The instant messengers already connected the people. The social, social networks is already consolidate the people in a global scale. Now the online financial services is melting the people in a while, in a one things. Who will manage the security, mm, not issues, the security process, the government or developers? I mean online banking. When you lost your password or ID card <laughs> for your instant messenger or social networks, it cost you nothing, but if you lost your banking password or token for access to online banking or any online services, you could lost much more. And not only developers has to decide what kind of level of, what the level of security must be. This is clear that this is not a technical decision. Uh, I don't agree with, uh, with your statement that, uh, that if you are losing the uh, the, the, your, your social uh, media account actually that uh, it doesn't cost you anything actually. Your rep if, if your reputation doesn't cost you anything then, then, it's, then this statement is true. 
<coughs> because you can actually use it for the other purposes. And what is happening in the in the network that every resource that is ac uh, that is accessible will, in some point, actually also misused. Yeah. Actually, it's it's pretty dangerous nowadays even not to have a Facebook account because uh, somebody will register an account with your name, your first and last name, upload your picture, and will try to actually to communicate or add as a friends your friends, and then. Uh, people generally trust in Facebook and, uh, and they will try to talk with your friends on your behalf and they will actually think that it's a legitimate stuff. And this stuff has already happened. So people, uh, I heard that there is a general advice for all the public figures that you, they really need to register their Facebook profiles. And losing access to that is pretty dangerous yeah. for that reason. One of the most famous examples. There, there are enough stupid people. You will, uh, the, the, the most famous example of this uh, uh, was pretty high profile. I think uh, now Mayor of Kuresaare, Hanna Sansa, who works as political officer in, our, uh, in EU uh, representation in Beijing, who, doesn't have, who didn't have a Facebook account. Uh, immediately when he arrived to Beijing, uh, apparently he had a Facebook. And everybody <laughs> knew who his friends were. And uh, I mean, he has a lot of friends, so uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty interesting. So when you, when you leave your laptop open with Facebook logged, in, Facebook logged in, people can pretend to be you and do all sorts of things to your um, online reputation, but at least they will be blocked from installing device drivers on your laptop, which is a good thing, because that's going to ask the system administrator password. Any other questions? By the way, Facebook supports two-factor authentication as well. So if you haven't it enabled, then go and do it today. Amen. So when I'm looking at the uh, uh, topic of this discussion, what can cyber criminals teach to IT, I want to ask, uh, what have you learned from uh, cyber criminals and how have you changed your behavior and uh, your organization? I compare cyber attackers with, with zombies. Um, and they have a couple of characteristics in common. Often, there, there's different ty types of zombies and there's different types of, of IT cr cyber criminals. But the most common part is not very sophisticated. We'll just go after you. There's an abundant supply of them and they're very, very, very persistent. So make sure that, that you minimize your attack service, that you have a defendable infrastructure, and that you close all doors and windows. And double tap. Make sure that you take your attack, analyze the attack, and make sure that it can't happen, can't happen again. So that's, that's the one part. We have to be aware that there is always a zombie out there that's willing to, willing to get us and willing to hurt us. On the other hand, you have the, the more higher, the more agile ones that, that do more attacks, but 99% of what you do, you can really cover, not by buying anti-foo, more antivirus, a layer seven, layer eight, layer nine, layer 10, layer 2000 firewall, but by making sure that your house is in order, that it's well maintained, that you actually don't open up more to the internet than you should. So part of the problem they learn, learn me is like, if you really do your basics, they will find some other brains somewhere that are easier to consume. So that's, that's one of the things they learn. Really love the question. Anybody else want to answer it? Yes, go ahead. I would like to add about the criminals that they have a little bit better situation than we have because uh, no restrictions regarding standards or uh, they don't need to follow kind of uh, legislation and rules. They simply ignore it and, and will be act uh, following efficiency. And most uh, risky business or risk, uh, risk area is where is money moving in the cyber world or ICT systems. It's interesting that you mentioned the legislation and criminals uh, Yesterday, I've seen on TV another 
a program about this Rove digital case and they actually, uh, they are not guilty anymore because they had everything written in the uh, in, uh, legal uh, stuff that, in the software that they were distributing. So that's yeah. about legal uh, stuff and criminals. I think if the question is what we, what we should learn, uh, then we um, uh, should start from asking uh, what are the facts that we need to accept first. And uh, first of all, the, um, I think the fact is that in this area, the bad guys will always outnumber vastly the good guys. This is, you, you, cannot, you cannot attack by mass in this area. Uh, another thing is that um, uh, at least uh, when I look some of the really large scale attacks that, that, that we have witnessed uh, to the recent dates, the attacks have ended because somebody who was perpetrated, uh, perpetrating them decided to end them, not because we came up with some sort of particularly wise uh, solution uh, to end it. I think this is also one of the realities. Uh, the third reality is the word criminal itself, which I find dangerous uh, because it, it leads us to our mindset and I think it, it leads us to the regulations and rules. Uh, the problem is that, uh, again, we tend to come up with all kinds of regulations and rules, uh, which I think the time is not mature yet. We see all kinds of international initiatives to regulate this and that and to restrict this and that in the technology, uh, in the technology field that actually ties our hands. The problem is when we fight an actual situation inter, uh, sort of between various countries, let's take a state level attack. Now we start fighting it, uh, we deploy, you know, 150 jurisdictions that all work together, exchange IP addresses, everything. It's very, very smooth. The moment we start the criminal case, it, there's one prosecutor who, has, who went to law school because he, she or he didn't like math, uh, <laughs> who now controls the process. I went to law school because I didn't like math, so uh, I can say that. Uh, and, and she now controls the process. We see, we talk about international cooperation and, and flexibility and, and everything. Immediately when we start applying those criminal procedure rules, the process dies. It just dies. And, uh, and this is, at least in the cyber world, I have seen it so many times and it's very, very frustrating. Uh, so I think this is one thing that we need to, uh, we need to take. The, I think one of the legal contributions by Estonia, one of the first ones, was by Professor Martens who was secret advisor to the Russian Tsar during Hague Peace Conference. And, and they had to tackle all kinds of new technology uh, and, uh, and, uh, and new kinds of problems. And, and one of the things that appeared in the battlefields of Europe in the end of 19th century was the uh, private contractors. And, uh, and they didn't know how to regulate. It. And Professor Martens, an Estonian guy, a lawyer, uh, he said, which became famous Martens clause in international law of armed conflict, said that Let's not touch it. We don't understand this. And there is now a clause in international law of war that, uh, you know, we try to apply rules to the problems that we don't understand fully to the extent that it's possible by using common sense and good conscience. And, uh, and I think with, with cyber and cyber criminals and fighting them, I think the biggest thing is to, is to try to go back to good old Professor Martens and, and apply this wise rule. All right, I think there's time for one last question from the audience. Uh, would you hire a really smart cyber criminal to your organization for part-time job or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> most, yes. most guys who do pen testing, they are basically uh, this type of guys. <laughs> Let's say you have a developer who wrote some malware, he's genius. <coughs> would you hire him for your projects? Sure. I think it's, it's about motivation. So if you have a smart guy and you know how to motivate him to, to put his knowledge into the right direction, then uh, it can work, and it surely will work. Of, of course, of course, you need to test the attitude of. Of this so, Dimka, if you find beautiful enough girl, actually, to motivate him. <laughs> <laughs> But 
it, it comes down to a point where is, is it, can you trust somebody or, or not? Um, if you can't trust the people that work for you, um, you can't trust what they build for you. Um, so it, the story would be, it, it depends. Um, if it is somebody who was showing off when he was a kid and it's, it's sort of a youthful sin uh, and he was dumb enough to get caught, um, then, I'm concerned, then there could be circumstances. If this is somebody that's uh, ruthless and, and, and thought it was just better to rob um, poor old ladies with an XPC uh, PC from their pension simply because he could, then I wouldn't hire him. Now, Kevin Mitnick is a good example. He's a security consultant nowadays, but he was in the jail for many years. Yeah. And there's probably no doubt that we would hire him <laughs> if we could. <laughs> excellent, excellent book written about Kevin Mitnick. He's the hacker crack town. Highly recommend. Okay, so one last question back there, and uh, that's really the last one. I have a question about uh, OpenSSL heartbeat case. I think uh, most of us got to know about this two years too late. And uh, even though the vulnerability was very serious, I think it can be compared with the banking crisis. And my question is, what should be done so that it won't happen again? I, th I think the key observation is it has already happened again, we just don't know about it. So um, for OpenSSL, it really helps if we, if we, if we raise some funding to, to actually make sure these guys don't work for tips. Um, so to make it not happen anymore to OpenSSL, I think that's one part. To make sure we never get a heart bleed, it's, it's not about not having and preventing the circumstances, it's how to deal with the vulnerabilities, <coughs> as you said in the, in, in the keynote speech. We need to be aware that this will happen again, and we need to make sure that we can survive that, just like we need to accept that zombies will be out there, and they're after our brains, and we just need to deal with that. Uh, but put the uh, detection on the profiling, uh, because uh, now if you are get, uh, getting those, uh, those uh, 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 no, heartbeat messages, then uh, you don't expect that their, their, uh, their uh, answers are long. So they're, they're you know, actually matching this kind of process, what you know actually, and, uh, and uh, observing their behavior, whether it does actually match to your model, no, then you will actually discover those kind of deviations, and then you have to go and investigate actually why you have this deviation. So, I completely agree that similar things definitely, no, I believe that similar things actually exist in one form or another. And what you have to do is actually <coughs> the observe your, your, uh, your system actually under your management and understand when it uh, be, uh, behaves actually in an unexpected way, and including people. And, and turning on, not turning on features you don't need. 90% of us didn't need a heartbeat feature in OpenSSL to start, to start with. It was only a very small minority, but in all Linux distributions, the feature was turned on. And the first patch that Red Hat, for instance, rolled out was just recompiling the code with the no heartbeat. I haven't checked that fact, but I just thought that actually this kind of, I have actually checked the code of OpenSSL that uh, where the vulnerability was. It was basically a one-liner that fixed that code. And uh, the thing is that I actually believe that with a good enough uh, static code analysis uh, tool, it would uh, at least show the, a warning or something about this code because it was pretty obvious when you look at it carefully. So what? What we can do is actually probably like fix or like more like test your code with some tools that you use uh, like more thoroughly. And uh, another option is to actually rewrite OpenSSL or use uh, another library for security that is written in a higher level language. Because uh, I think nowadays having buffer overrun type of uh, uh, security vulnerabilities is uh, 
is, is, is not nice. So, Anton, you, you are actually saying that we shouldn't be using, writing web servers in assembler. Any, any of course. And I think C is an outdated language, which is probably not a good, good language for writing secure code. All right. Unfortunately, we are that close to out of time. And the last remaining minute, I would like to offer our panelists if they have any remaining closing remarks. Anybody? Uh, no, what I, I believe is that uh, that people actually are still uh, learning how to how to eat this uh, this uh, security stuff, and uh, and it's clear that in this uh, this marketplace uh, we have uh, created first the features, and that now we're actually trying to catch up with uh, with the security. And uh, as optimist, I, I believe that uh, that humankind as the, as the as the collection actually can learn from their own mistakes and uh, this uh, security posture will go better. That's a really nice optimistic thought. Thank you and a big hand for the panel. <laughs> <laughs>